kept things very comfortable. So, one imagines he could have bought a house in Grafton Meadows, but um, he didn't. He wanted something simple. And he was keen on gardening. And he apparently used to cycle to the shop to get a newspaper or cycle to the pub, play darts, have a beer, come home. Very simple life, as described to me by Rosemary. Um, and they had normal everyday conversations. I, you know, I can't tell you things like that without thinking that um, it is as if he were pretending. It's just my opinion. There's absolutely no way of proving that whatsoever. If you're sufficiently frightened of something, so frightened that you think that if you start to resemble it in the least, that it's going to happen again, then you, the idea of actually pretending as a lifetime project lasting over 30 years, pretending to be another kind of person altogether, uh, might be attractive. On the other hand, the whole thing is that um, he may, as I said in my talk the other day, brain damage. Simple, well, I don't know if the word simple is correct, but it may be over a period, not in one go, but it may be over a period that certain mechanisms, uh, certain systems in the brain were put out of balance and simply could not recuperate. Well, I suppose the most extreme example of brain damage would be where tissues themselves are actually damaged, and that would be even worse. But once there's any level of brain damage as distinct from bad psychological problems, then there's nothing that can be done. You can't go in there and stitch it up again. It's just not possible. That's what you're left with. So, instead of his inventing a personality to get through those years, perhaps that was his personality. And perhaps he regarded his earlier self as a, an odd memory. Uh, he would, perhaps he knew it was him, and perhaps he knew that if he thought about it too much, it made him feel very uneasy, which kind of proved it was him. Uh, but, um, I don't know, it's the same, these ideas, <coughs> when you put them in a Hollywood movie with Betty Davis in them or something like that, they become the stuff of kind of spooky films, <laughs> whereby um, y you imagine um, this rather kind of intimidating figure with a stare, kind of inhabited by the ghost of his former self, keeping it at bay all the time. Or else you imagine something far sadder and much less exciting, which is, you know, the bloke who damaged his brain. Uh, and thanks to Rosie's careful protection, he was able to put together a very, very ordinary life. I mean, he didn't have a job. He didn't need a job. And we know that he liked, continued to like painting. Some of the paintings from the last period are quite ordinary, like pleasant watercolours, which show the skill. You know, he hadn't lost the skill. I mean, you get with brain damage, you get people who can still play the piano, or something like that. You know, people who used to be great pianists have terrible accidents, but they can still play the piano, sort of thing. I don't know, maybe, so maybe he lost some faculties, and, uh, but not everything. It's completely open, you know. There weren't any psychiatrists and psychologists taking notes as all this was going on. So you've got the opinions of people like myself. And that's about it, really. What does Rosie say? I don't know. I think Rosie, Rosie's objective seems to be to stop this kind of speculation. Why are you all so interested? This was 40 years ago, she says. If you were to ask a <coughs> question like that, you'd get that response, I think, even now. I mean, I saw her the other night at the happening. She, I hadn't seen her in 40 years. It was so jolly. She, she's allowed to be now. She doesn't have to be at the severe guardian anymore. And I just got to, I saw her for a minute and said, how did you do? Nice to see you. And she was ever so jolly. Um, maybe she always was, even in the severe years, but she would never let you know that, because her job was to do this, you know, non-stop. Uh, when I have pressed her about it, because I rang her once or twice, and rather forcibly reminded her that I did used to be good friends with Sid and therefore she suggested or implied that she could trust me. Um, she did, she would talk about the average day in his life, but um, uh, she wasn't going to be drawn in any psychological analysis. You could tell it really annoyed her. Um, maybe she found it distressing, maybe she knew 
things. Maybe she knew of a fragility in this whole setup that she had to keep the cork on. I, I, I really don't know. Uh, all these, they're all interesting. That was all it was in time, though, wasn't it? Which? Well, but it was, it was quite fragile, and therefore his way of coping with the cyclist it was, was to shut it out and just, just leave this very, very simple life on a day-to-day yeah. -day basis. I wonder how much energy it takes on a day-to-day -day basis to keep doing this all the time throughout your life. Stop pushing things away, suppressing, uh, great, suppressing things that remind you, suppressing things in the outside world that remind you of the past and suppressing ideas and thoughts and memories that may come in. I would have thought it was quite exhausting. Like, um, you know, comedians who can't stop being funny. People like that, you know, and you think, God, it's exhausting on a daily basis. Peter Sellers, mm -hmm. for example, he couldn't stop it. He couldn't turn it off. Mm -hmm. I've ever seen an interview with him where he admitted he'd forgotten what his voice was like. Because he spent 23, 23 hours a day he was putting on funny voices. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if Sid experienced any kind of similar sort of exhaustion, that maintaining something. God knows. I'm repeating myself now, but I'm just, you know, I still think about that. Uh, what, the, what the truth of the matter was. And of course, I'm pitching it as though it was either this or that, and it could well have been a, a mixture of too much drugs and very exacerbated inherent psychological potentials that maybe many of us have got that we never have to learn about. I mean, LSD is so powerful. Kids that take ecstasy now, um, ecstasy is relatively mild. And the doses that people took, they are shocking to even people of a later generation who take LSD. People used to take 500 micrograms, the tiny amount that's big for LSD. Um, and this, uh, you know, doctors who work with LSD in a controlled therapeutic situation give less than a hundred. You know, that's quite enough, thank you very much, to loosen people up. In the same way that doctors used to work with ecstasy, loosening people up, making them more amenable to psychotherapeutic conversation. But the kids in those days, God knows, who said, it's like, you know, you go into a country where you don't drink pints, all pubs serve beer in five pint glasses, right? And for some reason, uh, LSD was served in these giant doses. And everybody thought that was normal. And it's kind of, you know, there's a point where things are moving so fast that people um, were experimenting with just about every drug they could get their hands on. Some were just physical drugs that made your body feel good, like speed and opiates. And they were, which are sort of, well, we know how dangerous they can be. roll them up, smoke them, within two to three minutes, you're in God's lap. Uh, you stay there for 20 minutes, and then you go back and off to work. It was known as a businessman's trip, because you could do it at lunchtime. It was like being blasted out of the earth on a rocket to a nearby planetary system, hanging out there for a bit, and again, all the way back again, <coughs> off to work. Um, and I imagine that, too. I would have thought the brain must find that immensely difficult to handle more than, you know, once every now and again. It's not built for it, really. But, uh, you know, with the very charismatic and fairly consistent influence of Timothy Leary from over the other side of the Atlantic, a charming man, a good-looking man, a charismatic man, who made it all sound terribly, terribly attractive, this business of, you know, taking LSD, it was powerful enough to make you see through society. I think, fuck, I don't have anything to do with this. This is just a charade. This is all pretense. Uh, and um, so let's just walk away. And as I said earlier this week, hundreds of thousands of kids walked away. Um, and uh, some of them walked back again. Um, but 
a, a tiny handful, I think, would probably encounter uh, a sort of complete inability ever to touch the ground again. It's not the case, in my view, that if you take a load of acid, you will be fucked up. It's what you take into the experience with you, I, I imagine. And some have an, an enviable stability that uh, endures. And there's an awful lot of melodramatic talk about you take this and it will melt you. Uh, but actually, some people took it, it melted them, and then they came back again. Perfectly all right. Most people, in fact. Shall we go back to the van?